This is a production of Gordon College's Scott Radio. Scott Radio. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to the Photo Finish, Scott Radio's home for motorsports. I'm your host, Ben Schneider, and I don't have a guest with me this week, and that might be a good thing because I want to have a serious conversation about the state of NASCAR right now and where I think our fan base is as a whole. So it's going to be a much more uh, stock car racing centric show this week. Uh, but first, I do want to make note of a couple more uh, serious matters. Uh, it was a crazy week with hauler problems. Uh, two different teams uh, on their way to Kansas, Colleg Racing in the Xfinity Series and JTG Doherty Racing in the Cup Series, uh, both had some issues getting to the track. Colleg Racing's hauler was involved in a terrible accident on the interstate on the way to Kansas Speedway. The hauler was absolutely totaled. Uh, fortunately, the team was able to come together and enter Ross Chastain's number 10 Chevrolet as expected. And the team owners said that they were committed to Ross 100%. There was no way that they were even considering withdrawing the car from the race. So good to see them able to bounce back. And fortunately, nobody was seriously injured in the crash, which when you look at the pictures of the accident is pretty remarkable. And JTG Doherty Racing similarly had a fire breakout in their hauler that left one of their cars totaled. But again, it didn't affect their ability to start the race. They turned one of their backup cars into a primary car, and they get a lot of support from Hendrick Motorsports anyway, so Hendrick was able to help them out this weekend as well. So glad to see that everybody involved with both of those teams is all right and well, and that they were able to get their cars to the track and on the racetrack as expected. I also want to extend my condolences to the family of Lonnie Troxel. Lonnie was a truck series owner from 2000 to 2004. He owned a very small team that competed there. And I actually feel kind of ashamed that I didn't notice this until uh, the news of his death broke. Um, I mentioned last week, if you listened to my story on Nazareth Speedway, when I posted the pictures from the track, someone had replied to me and tagged Mario Andretti asking if he had seen this. Well, that person, and I didn't make this connection at the time because I was so focused on the track and everything that I had just taken in and the tweet was kind of blowing up. Uh, that was actually Lonnie Troxel. Lonnie was somebody who, despite having not owned a team for a long time, was still very active on Twitter, on social media, and always had uh, some thoughtful insights to give on what was going on in the world of NASCAR. And certainly somebody that I know a lot of people are going to miss. And I want to extend my thoughts and prayers and condolences out to his family. All right, so let's get into the main topic that I want to discuss today, because I woke up Monday morning, this is verbatim in a tweet I sent out, to a divided fan base, and it's a fan base that I think is one of the most divided in all of sports, and strictly speaking in terms of NASCAR, probably the most divided it's ever been, at least in my lifetime. To me, I, I, I look at Twitter every day, and I see fans on totally separate sides of the spectrum here. I see, when we're talking about the Kansas race this weekend, I saw people saying that NASCAR is totally rigged, fixed, WWE style. They did everything in their power to get their most popular driver, Chase Elliott, through to the next round of the playoffs. And they're sacrificing all legitimacy and credibility for the sake of entertainment. And then you have people that are on the total opposite extreme of that, that think that playoffs are the best thing to happen to the sport. It's constant edge of your seat excitement. You never know what's going to happen. A driver can win every single race and then they get to homestead and don't perform and they lose the championship. And, and that's great. You never know what's going to happen. Only what's going on right now in this one particular race matters or this one particular round matters. The rest of the season is all thrown out. We all reset. You have to perform. And I'm definitely in the middle. Um, I'm, I'm not saying NASCAR is rigged by any means. That's absolutely not true. But what I am saying is I think if you take a look at what race control has done three of the last four weeks, we've had controversy with race control. If you take a look at the calls that they've made, if you take a look at the playoff system that we have, I feel like legitimacy is being sacrificed for the sake of entertainment. I'm not saying the sport is fixed, but I'm, I am saying that there's a problem with that because I don't know that we can crown a champion in the most 
legitimate way or that we're going to necessarily crown the best champion next month when we get to Homestead. And I really think that, you know, you look at how divided our fan base is right now in the world of NASCAR. I really think if the playoffs or chase or whatever you want to call it hadn't been introduced 15, 16 years ago in 2004, I really think we wouldn't be here right now. And I think if you want proof of that, you just have to take a look at IndyCar. How many IndyCar fans do you know who are begging for a playoff system to be implemented? I don't see any. If somebody wants to let me know, if somebody wants to send me a tweet that they find, go go ahead. That's that's something that I haven't seen a lot of. How many F1 fans do you see begging for stage racing? Saying, hey, these these races are are boring and everything. We we want more safety cars. We want planned periods where we're going to halt the action and award some points and we'll restart the race from there. I don't see any of that. And I could see where fans, if we were still going by a regular season championship, I could see where fans might say in the case of a driver, you know, clinching the championship with two races to go because he has such a big points lead. I could see fans theoretically in a world where we never introduce playoffs thinking, well, you know, I really wish that the championship had gone down to the checkered flag at Homestead. I, I really wish that were the case. And I think you're seeing F1 fans say that as well. But when, when F1 fans say that, they're not saying that because they want a playoff. They're saying that because they want Ferrari to get their act together and take the fight to Mercedes so that Sebastian Vettel can be fighting Lewis Hamilton down to the checkered flag at Abu Dhabi. They don't want playoffs. They want multiple teams in the mix and so closely matched that it's natural, that we get that battle all the way to the end naturally. And the format that NASCAR uses to crown its champion creates that no matter what. If it's close anyway, we reset everything and make it close for the sake of making it close. If, if a driver has a three-race lead in the championship points, we reset it and make it close for the sake of making it close. And what happens when you do that? I sat here in this exact same seat last year and gave the example of A.J. Allmendinger, one of my all-time favorite drivers, a bit of an underdog, but somebody who's really good on the road courses and also happens to be really good at Martinsville, which is a short track that's so flat, it might as well be a road course in many respects. It resembles how you drive a road course in some ways. So for the sake of argument, let's just say A.J. goes out and wins Watkins Glen, which he's done. He did it in 2014. He wins Watkins Glen. That's all he has to do. You win a race, you're in the playoffs as long as you're in the top 30 in points. That's it. He's, he's set. He's ready to go. Now, let's say he goes out and steals a win at the Charlotte Roval. He won the Charlotte Roval race just last month in the Xfinity Series. I wouldn't put it past him to win there. He started on the outside of the front row last year and ran in the top 10 all day. He could win that race. I wouldn't put that past him. Let's say he has a pretty good second round. Maybe he doesn't quite win Talladega, but he avoids the big wreck and a bunch of playoff drivers get involved in the big wreck that sets them back. So he's through to round three. We get to round three and he steals a win at Martinsville, which I think is plausible. He's got two second place finishes at Martinsville in his career. I think he could easily steal a win at Martinsville. Then he's in the final four at Homestead. It's a mid-race restart. The three championship contenders competing for the title with him take each other out in an accident and AJ Allmendinger crosses the finish line in 23rd two laps down and he's your champion because he's the only one left now obviously it would take a perfect storm of events for that to happen but it's theoretically possible with how AJ Allmendinger runs on a regular basis or ran on a regular basis last year I know he's mostly retired at this point with where he was performing, he should not be anywhere near the lead of a championship standings. I don't say that to be mean. I love the guy. But he's not in the best equipment. He's not a superstar. It, it shouldn't be considered rude to say he's not a championship contender. It's just a matter of fact. But that's what this playoff system allows. It would be like in F1 calling... An Alfa Romeo driver, Antonio Giovinazzi, I'll just call him out here. It'd be like saying he has a legitimate shot at taking home the F1 World Championship. F1 fans would have a riot, I think, if Antonio Giovinazzi won a championship or was in the mix for a championship. 
But that's what this playoff system allows. You can win one race, DNF every race the rest of the season, then do what you need to do in the playoffs and win your way to a championship. On the flip side, you can also theoretically win all 35 races before Homestead, every single one of them. Lead every lap. Obviously, again, this would never happen. I'm just speaking theoretically because of the parody we have, but you can win every race, all 35. You get to Homestead, maybe you miss a shift, you blow an engine, you finish fourth in points. What other series allows that? If you win every IndyCar race before you get to Laguna Seca and then you blow an engine, you're, you're fine. You've already clinched for championship because you've been so dominant. And I saw an argument this week that I thought we had killed off. I was really disappointed because I thought we killed this argument a long time ago. But people are talking about the 2007 Patriots. The team that went 18-0, undefeated in the regular season, won their two playoff games to get to the Super Bowl, and then the 10-6 and Giants shocked the world and knocked them off their throne, and they win the Super Bowl instead. Get rid of all the 19-0 Shirts and memorabilia, we don't, we're not going to use it. We're not going to bring it out. The Giants are the champions. So people say, well, if the Patriots can win every game and lose a Super Bowl, why can't a driver win every race? And my answer to that is very simple. You're making a stick and ball sport comparison. People are comparing NASCAR to the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, the NHL, what, whatever. When they really ought to be comparing it to, I don't know, ARCA, IMSA, F1, IndyCar, World Endurance Championship, stop me whenever you like. That's the comparison we should be making. Because in the NFL, two teams play each other at once. And, and college football is the same way. I, I talk about the Premier League in, in soccer over in Europe sometimes. They don't have a playoff. They just crown whoever has the best record at the end of the season is the champion. I actually don't have a problem with that. I think that theoretically could work in baseball. You want to take the team with the best record in the American League, the team with the best record in the National League, and there's no playoffs? They just go straight to the World Series? I wouldn't have a problem with that. We shorten the season a little bit. I don't see a problem with that at all. But you need a playoff in football. You, the, the college football playoff movement was successful for the reason that the best teams very rarely actually play each other. So when you have multiple teams that are you know, standing at just one loss or two losses or maybe a couple of teams that are undefeated, you can't really say who the best is without having them play each other. And because NFL teams play so few games, they only play 16 times a year, it's pretty much the same argument there. But motor racing is different. There isn't one NFL game every week where all 32 teams are out there competing. Two teams play at a time. So you have to have them play each other to determine who's better. All 40 drivers take the green flag in one race every weekend. You don't need to have multiple races to determine who the best driver is or who the best car is, who the best team is, or whatever. So when you talk about the 2007 Patriots, I, I really don't see how that's a relevant, good argument to be making here. The Patriots, yeah, they had an undefeated season. They never lost a game. But that's how the NFL is. You, you go down to the wire. You go to the Super Bowl. Motor racing doesn't have anything like that in any other series except NASCAR. So I feel like you should be able to say if a driver is dominant, that's why we keep track of a point system in the first place. They accumulate a lot of points. It's fair to crown them a champion. That, that's how we should be crowning them a champion. But NASCAR is so, they so badly want a Game 7 moment. They want it to make sure that we are going to Homestead with four drivers in the fight for the championship, and we don't know who's going to win it until the checkered flag falls, that we're going to make it happen automatically. It might play out naturally. It did play out naturally in ARCA just this week, and we'll get to that in a second. But we want to make sure it happens. Whether we risk losing a legitimate champion in the process or not. I think Martin Truex Jr.'s championship in 2017 is totally legitimate. He would have won the championship anyway. He had the best car all year. He was far and away the most deserving driver of a championship that season. 
But then you look two years earlier, Kyle Busch. And let me be very clear. I like Kyle Busch. I'm not taking anything away from Kyle Busch at all to come back from that injury that he had. He had a phenomenal year. Absolutely. He doesn't, he doesn't choose the format he's given. NASCAR chooses the format. He absolutely deserved his championship. I don't take that away from him at all. But is his championship legitimate when we're talking about motorsports in general? I think that's questionable. Because if he were an IndyCar driver and he missed the first third of a season with the injury that he had, that's it. That's his season over. And it's not because he did anything wrong. It's just he got hurt. He couldn't compete. He missed a bunch of races. He's already so far behind in the points that he can't recover from that. But NASCAR's playoff system allows him to get back into the game and work his way towards Homestead where he can win a championship. We saw Tyler Reddick last year in the Xfinity Series. One Daytona looked like he was the third, not, not even third best driver in the series, the third best driver on his four-car team all year. Clearly behind the top dogs of the series. But he, one Daytona, he could just relax all the regular season, did what he had to do in the playoffs, one out, one homestead, he's the champion. Even though Christopher Bell won seven races, even though Daniel Hemrick had so many top fives, didn't win a race, but he was super consistent, Tyler Reddick's your champion instead. But that's just the playoff issue that's dividing fans. Here we have race control. I said it's the third time in four weeks where they, they've been so laughably inconsistent. On the final lap or heading toward the final lap, there was an accident on the front stretch, and Denny Hamlin was this close to crossing the line to take the white flag, which means the race would be over. There wouldn't be an overtime. And, and how do you like this? NASCAR has overtime. You want to make a stick and ball sport comparison. What other motorsport has overtime? NASCAR has overtime. That's just, that's just another thing that I think divides fans and, and, you know, they're very split on that. But anyway, let's get back to race control here. Race control threw the caution flag so quickly that Denny Hamlin didn't cross the line and we had to line it up for another restart. And it looked suspicious to some because Chase Elliott is the most popular driver in the series. And had Denny Hamlin crossed the line, taken the white flag, the race would have been over, the field would have been frozen, and Brad Keselowski would have advanced in the, to the next round of the playoffs. Kansas was a cutoff race. But because they had a restart, which they didn't need to have, they did not need to draw the race out that long, and had that accident happened on lap 50 or early, earlier in the race, I guarantee you the caution would not have come out that quickly. The caution lights would not have been on. Had that been the case... Chase Elliott would have been eliminated and it would have been Brad Keselowski making it to the next round. But because what happened happened, Elliott gains a few spots, Keselowski loses a few, and it affects the outcome of the championship standings and could affect the outcome of who wins the championship. Brad Keselowski goes on a tear. He wins Homestead. He could be the champion, but he got eliminated at Kansas. It's a, an implication that can literally determine the champion. And fans, this is where the conspiracy theories come out. They say Elliott's the most popular driver. They rigged it for him. I don't buy that. But I do buy the idea that NASCAR threw that caution flag so quickly because they wanted another restart. Because they wanted drama. They wanted more excitement. They wanted to draw it out. They wanted to see how much entertainment they could milk out of the moment. And it's something that bothers me something that I don't think it, it goes back to the issue of legitimacy and if you want to talk about consistency we can go back to Talladega with the whole yellow line rule which came back in both races I won't talk too much about that because I know we covered that last week and then we talk about Charlotte the the Roval cautions were they, they were so happy the trigger happy on the caution button at the Roval because we saw cars do a half spin not even come to a complete stop. They threw the caution flag. And then I, th I think you can use this as evidence that NASCAR's not rigging it for Chase Elliott because, like I said, Daniel Suarez is totally has his car destroyed on the front stretch. He does a second half spin. He's a complete mess. He stopped, and they did not throw the caution at all. 
Chase Elliott was in the lead. They could have ended the race and given the win to Chase Elliott, but they didn't. They chose not to. Chase Elliott, unfortunately, it didn't affect the outcome of the race, but if that happens in the middle of the race, yeah, you're going to throw up a caution. There's debris all over the track. There's a big wreck. It's the inconsistency of race control, the joke of a playoff system that we have that just, to me, is creating so many issues. And I really think if you flash back 15 years, if this had never been implemented at all, if we had a competent crew working in the race control booth, I think the state of our sport would be a lot greater. I think our fan base wouldn't be as divided as it is. And I think TV ratings and attendance, I don't know this for sure, but this is just my guess, when you draw, or, or rather when you push your hardcore fans, traditional fans away with all these gimmicks, they leave. They stop watching, they stop coming to the races. And people wonder why the attendance and ratings are down. I think this is a big part of it. But I think all you have to do is take a look at ARCA. ARCA doesn't have playoffs. This was the last true ARCA race. Of course, NASCAR bought ARCA last year, and this is the final, this was the final race for the ARCA series as we know it before it's all under the NASCAR banner. It actually will still be called the ARCA Racing Series next year, or the ARCA Menard Series for sponsorship reasons, but ARCA, of course, was bought out by NASCAR. But they don't have a playoff system. The cars look very similar. They have overtime, but they don't have stages. They don't have playoffs. The championship still came down to the wire. Christian Eckes beat Michael Self on the racetrack and in the championship because the standings were so close. They didn't need playoffs. They created the same amount of excitement that we're going to get at Homestead in a few weeks. And they didn't need playoffs to do it. So I think the answer to problems are very simple. Go back to the basics. Go back to what worked for 55 years. Dump the stages. Dump the playoffs. Dump overtime. Dump the gimmicks. Let's go back to a more traditional series. And I know some fans are going to be unhappy about that, but that's the way I see it. I feel like we've lost legitimacy in NASCAR, and those are the reasons for it. But let's get into the ARCA race, because we actually have a couple of really intriguing storylines here. I can't remember the last time, before Kyle Busch, that is. Of course, Kyle Busch, as I mentioned, had his injury before coming back to win the championship, missed a bunch of races. I can't remember the last time we had a champion that actually didn't run every race of the season. But that's the case with Christian Eckes. He missed a race because he was sick and still was able to accumulate enough points to beat Michael Self this week at Kansas. So he won the race. Michael Self finished second, and that's exactly how we finished him in championship as well. And I also want to give a shout-out to the rookie of the year. Now, Christian Eckes was a rookie, um, but per ARCA rules, because he won the championship, he forfeited his ability to also win the rookie of the year award. So the Rookie of the Year is a driver by the name of Tommy Vi Jr. Now, he's driving for a very small, underfunded team, actually starting and parked a bunch of races this season. And it gives me great joy, and it's very amusing to see him. And that's not to, that's not to take anything away from, from Tommy Vi. Um, I, I love the fact that he's Rookie of the Year. I love the fact that he's getting a moment in the spotlight, along with the, the team that he's driving for. Um, I always, I'm a fan of the underdog. I love seeing moments like that. Um, but I, I feel like it says something about the state of ARCA where he has, where he can win rookie of the year. You know, what, what does that say about where driver development is right now? I don't know. Maybe more drivers are in K&N West or K&N East, or maybe they're not anywhere because they don't have funding. It's a problem that I think we've talked on the show about numerous times, the Small car counts. There were only just over 20 cars at Kansas again. Uh, it's down from fields that were easily full just a few years ago. Uh, so that's my hope with this ARCA k and semi-merger that we kind of have coming. Uh, that if we can bring the fields together, unify the rules package, that maybe the field sizes will continue, will start to grow again. Um, but I did want to give Tommy Vi a shout-out because I think it's so cool that he gets that moment in the spotlight as Rookie of the Year in the ARCA Series. So that was the ARCA race at Kansas. NASCAR's Xfinity Series and Cup Series were also at Kansas. And the Xfinity race was a very interesting one. A lot of championship contenders, playoff drivers, 
running into problems. Garrett Smithley, uh, who you may remember from the Las Vegas race in the Cup Series just a few weeks ago, having a run-in with Kyle Busch. He was lap traffic, didn't get out of the way, damaged Kyle Busch's car. That affected his result. Well, he was in this Xfinity race, and he caused controversy again. He was about to get lapped and drifted up right in front of the path of Chris of, of uh, Chase Briscoe rather, and Christopher Bell, and ended up sending Bell spinning, putting Briscoe into the wall, and that basically took both of them out of contention. So now there's more controversy regarding lap cars. What should they do? Are spotters to blame? And I don't want to be too hard on Garrett Smithley. I do think he should have gotten out of the way. I do think it was, you know, a poor judgment move on his part. But like I said, I'm a fan of the underdogs. They absolutely have a right to be out there. They absolutely have a right to be racing as long as they can meet minimum speed. And I hate it for Chase Briscoe and Christopher Bell. Uh, it did ruin their race, but I think fans have come down way too hard on on all these smaller teams. Um saying that, you know, if we're in the playoffs, they should just get off the track if they're not competitive. I don't believe that at all. Um, I believe every team has a right to be out there as long as they can put a car forward that's capable of racing at a, at, if not a competitive for the win speed, at least competitive enough speed to the point where it's not a danger on the track. But that was what happened to Christopher Bell and Chase Briscoe. Cole Custer and Tyler Reddick got into a fist fight on pit road and the crews got involved and it was actually just announced today there aren't going to be any pen penalties coming from that. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't think there should be any penalties coming the driver's way. Uh, I, I think it's... I don't condone fighting in general, uh, but I do think it makes for uh, some good highlight reels and some good media attention when drivers aren't happy with each other, when they're using words with each other and, and everything. And I would much rather see them do what... Custer and Reddick did on pit road and take it out on the track with their race cars. Uh, but I do think some of the crew members escalating things, I think that's a little uncalled for. So I would have liked to see NASCAR come down with some fines for that. Uh, but there was some contact while those two were racing and Custer ended up going into the wall. Reddick went on to finish second. Custer was relegated to 11th. So you can maybe see why he wasn't so happy with Tyler after the race. But Brandon Jones, of all people, driving for Joe Gibbs Racing, who we've talked about on the show as one of the quintessential underperforming pay drivers. With everybody having trouble around him, Brandon Jones was able to steal a victory in his 134th Xfinity Series start. He grabs the win. And I'm a little disheartened to see how hard people have come down on him. You know, he's, he's a professional athlete doing his job. I don't think he's a superstar by any means. I do think he's definitely really, really, really underperformed. Um, but wh why are we not happy for the guy? Like, you know, he's it's not his fault. Everybody ran into problems around him that maybe made his path to the win a little bit easier. But he went out and won an Xfinity Series race. It's something that every driver who takes the green flag uh, is trying to do. So I'm happy for the guy. I hope if you're listening, you are too. And I hope Brandon Jones can continue to develop. I know a lot of people don't like him because they think he's a waste of space taking up a good Xfinity Series car, but who knows? This might be something that lights the fire under him, or he could go back to running in the teens and be a footnote the rest of the year. But I also want to bring up briefly, Brandon Jones made the playoffs. He was eliminated in the first round, but had he had a slightly better round of 12, he'd be going to Homestead with a shot of a championship. So again... I've got nothing against Brandon Jones personally, but I think if you look at the season that he's had, he's really not a legitimate championship contender. He shouldn't be considered a legitimate championship contender, but he would be had he had just a slightly better first three races of these playoffs. It just makes you think, and I think is proof that the playoff system we have is not that great. But if you listen to the first 15 minutes of the show, you already know that I think that. So let's move on to the cup race at Kansas. As I mentioned, Denny Hamlin beat Chase Elliott, and I think Hamlin at this point has to be considered the championship favorite. Um, sometimes when it's your year, it's your year, and just Denny Hamlin getting off to the best start you can with a win of the Daytona 500, I just think the stars are aligning. He's won a bunch of races this year. I, I think he's kind of having a career resurgence. Remember, this is a guy that people are saying, you know, Toyota has a lot of development drivers, and they really only have... Joe Gibbs Racing in the Cup Series, so they all have to go somewhere. 
And if Hamlin's underperforming, could he be at risk of losing his ride? I think he's proving all the doubters wrong with the season that he's having. So I think if you look at the three Gibbs drivers that are left in the playoffs and probably Joey Logano, Kevin Harvick, maybe Chase Elliott. I know Elliott's looked pretty strong. I think any one of those six could theoretically pull it off at Homestead this year. Uh, I'm not sure about Larson or uh, Ryan Blaney. Ryan Blaney's the other one, of course. Um, I just don't know that they've had, not that they've had bad seasons, but it took them until they got into the playoffs to get their wins. Uh, So I think they've been a step behind the remaining playoff drivers all year. Uh, But like I've said, if you make it to Homestead, I think you've got a clear competitive shot. So more power to them. They can go out and get it done. We'll see what happens. We have to say goodbye to Brad Keselowski, as I mentioned. A little controversial how it happened, but he was probably the most notable one eliminated because he was looking strong, was looking good. He had an edge in points, but just really did not have a good Kansas race at all. And that's all it takes. So he will not be fighting for a championship this season, nor will William Byron, Alex Bowman, or Clint Boyer. So those are your four drivers who are eliminated. And I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. So next week... As I mentioned, NASCAR is at Martinsville, and it's the Truck Series and the Cup Series. So the Xfinity Series gets the week off. Formula One is back in Mexico next week, and Lewis Hamilton could clinch his sixth world championship overall and fifth in the last six seasons. It's not too likely. Valtteri Bottas, I'm sure, will have a very strong race as well. But we'll see what happens there, and hopefully I'm going to have a guest on to talk about the F1 season as well. So for now, I'm Ben Schneider. Hope you enjoyed listening. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Leave a comment, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Have a good night, everybody.